Take it easy, I'm not Homer Samson that we're looking for. All right. Assalamu alaikum, wushraakum, labas, alhamdulillah. That was Algerian dialect. And if you don't understand it, and I can clearly tell that from the look at your faces now, I recommend you start considering it simply because my generation of Algerians are going to be knocking the doors of every single country of yours soon. Well, honestly, the main reason why I spoke in our Derja, our dialect here in the United States, is the following. Two weeks ago, State Secretary John Kerry visited my country, and apparently, what happened is that our representatives represented us in French. So I got my American and international friends asking me the following question. Is French your official language? The answer is simple. Hell no. <laughs> <coughs> the two official languages of the country are Arabic, the language of our religion, Islam, that we are so proud of, and Amazigh or Berber, the language of the native indigenous people that we are so proud of as well. French is a bad habit, <laughs> truly, that the older generation inherited from the colonization system and they're trying to confer to us. To them, I say, that ain't going to happen. I am a grandson of Shaheed, who died fighting the idea of integrating French in our identity. And guess what? I'll do the same. And this is not only addressed to French, this is addressed to anyone on planet Earth who wants to inject anything in our beautiful identity. That is this gorgeous mix of Arabs and Berbers under the umbrella of the wise instructions of Islam. So we know who we are, and we are so proud of it. This is the first element of the equation that I want to leave you with. So stalk it in your brains for a moment. All right? OK. Actually, I'm not here to speak to you. I'm here to speak through you. I am not here to tell you what I'm doing. I'm here to challenge the concepts and the frames of what we're all doing. I'm here with a couple of innocent, politically correct questions that I myself do not have the answers for, but I'll be certainly shooting them here to provocate your thinking, challenge your conceptions or assumptions, and to hopefully trigger your attention to something that is at least new. But before that, I have a couple of stories that I want to share with you. I want you to read this. Where is Lior? Have your tissues ready? All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. The first story is, is the following. Take a look at this picture. That's me, like two weeks ago. And as you can tell, I had the complete smile, right? Now I have this smile. I got half of my face paralyzed. Doctors, they call it Bell's palsy. I call it be careful of what you wish for. You know why? Because when I was a kid, I wanted to become two things. One, a pirate. Two, I wanted to be strong and look like Rocky Balboa from the movies. You know the guy, right? Right, so I got two dreams coming true in one day. All right, so now when I smile and talk, I look like Sylvester Stallone with a beard. And when I have to sleep, I have to wear an eye patch so I become master of the Caribbeans. <laughs> Why am I telling you this? I believe I'm addressing change makers. And there is this step in change making that we all tend to ignore or neglect. I'm speaking about the appreciation of the little things that we already have. So I want you to take a second to appreciate every little thing that you have now and be grateful and thankful for it. And that's the second element of the equation. My eye used to blank like a few times a minute, <coughs> excuse me, protecting me and my vision. I miss that now. So remember the first element and the second element. And to be honest, let's cut the drama. This is not a big deal. This is an issue, right? But it's not a problem. Because honestly, I got 99 problems. And Algeria is all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you a story or a real problem. Six years ago, I had this thing. And uh, I had to live with this thing for five long years. 
This thing prevented me from sleeping like normal people do. This thing prevented me from communicating with people, from enjoying my family, having fun with my friends like all of you do. This thing was painful, stressful, in some occasions embarrassing and shameful. And I had to live with this thing for five long years. And I'm here today with all the courage that God put in me to tell you that more than six years ago I had I had to study engineering for five long freaking years. That's what I had. <laughs> That's the pain that I was dealing with. All right, where are the engineers in the room? You see, only a few engineers. You know why engineers do not have the time to come and enjoy this kind of gatherings? You know why? Because they are so busy making our world a better, a better world. And guess what? They do it. They implement it. They execute it. They don't just talk about it. So to all the engineers around the world, brothers and sisters, well, let me be realistic, brothers and the few sisters that we got, <laughs> I promise you I will gain some appreciation back at least today and at least from these people. Now, I graduated from the Institute of Electrical Engineering. And in Algeria, after graduation, I faced this career path that was designed to me by the mindset of the people. The career path was as follows. If you are lucky enough or well-connected enough, you will get a job with a national or a multinational oil and gas company. You work so hard, you make some good money, you buy a car, you buy an apartment, you get married, and you gain the respect of every single body around you. And now, what I'm about to say is something that I truly deeply mean. It's something that might sound sarcastic, but it's true. If you are an Algerian young man, and you manage to buy a car, to buy an apartment, to get married, and by the way, in the region, these three things decided to jam from the right box to the dreams box. So if you manage to do these three at a young age, but your hard work and hard work only, and by what we call in the region your halal money, then you're a goddamn man who deserves respect. But that is exactly what the system wants you to think, believe, and more importantly, dedicate your time, your energy, your potential, and talent into doing. And speaking about the system itself, I was a teeny tiny element of a bigger system up to this second all my life, starting from primary school when I was a little kid carrying the bag doing the homeworks and following the rules, the same thing in elementary school. In high school though, I got this crazy idea and I was like, you know what, if you can't prove to the people that you are outstanding, then you probably could jump out of this system and deserve a better treatment. I worked so hard, I graduated as top outstanding students in the country. I was awarded by the president, he gave me a laptop, I mean, he gave me a laptop. <laughs> yes, he's short and yes, I'm mean. <laughs> and uh, a trip to Turkey, Istanbul, so we went for 10 days, we came back, and hypothetically, this is what I imagined at the airport, a big banner telling me, Nasser, welcome back to the system. Go back to the line with your brothers and sisters, you idiot. You thought you can jump out of the system. So after graduation, the graduation from university, I was like, I'm done. I tried to jump out of it, I could not do it. I tried, well, this might disappoint you, I've never been really interested in changing it yet. So I was like, at least for the love of God, understand it. For that reason, and for the first time, I decided not to follow the system, the career path that was designed to me, but I decided to take the beautiful courage and follow my passion. So I decided to study the most boring topic in academia, and by that I mean politics. <laughs> but I got another element of the equation, which was I took the courage to follow my own passion. I broke this taboo that I have to follow the system. But in the very first interaction with the people from the political science department, or in the very first readings, I mean readings of the political science books, I felt that the way politicians think execute and do things is kind of inefficient, at least comparing to the way engineers do things. For that reason, 
I had to follow the other elements of the equation, and I had to challenge myself, challenge my current skills, and adapt to the changes. So I started using my engineering skills into doing politics. I'm going to illustrate to you how it works with one simple example that relates to all of you here in the room, and then we see how it works. Are you guys ready? Political engineering 101? Are you ready? OK. The first rule in engineering, we don't take notes. So you don't need any papers or whatever. Just follow. I was a control engineer, right? And the main idea behind control engineering is that you have a system, an input, and an output, or a desired output. The desired output is the state that you want to reach or the outcome that you want to get. The system is the machinery that when it functions, it gives you the output. The input, though, is what triggers the machinery to function so that it gives you the desired output. Let's project this on the Arab Spring. I wouldn't call it a spring, not a revolution. So as an engineer, and this is my example, I would call it the Arab X, the Arab variable X. So in your opinion, what was the desired output what was the outcome that we wanted to have out of the Arab Spring. People were chanting and looking for freedom, better education, better employment, better economy. If we put all these great things in one box, people were looking for a better life. What was the machine that when it moved, when it woke up, we got the Arab Spring? It was people. To be more precise, it was the youth. It was you. The input, though, that triggered the Arab youth in their journey seeking for a better life was democracy. So this is our system at state zero. This is a few seconds before Bouazizi burned himself. Now let's see state now. Did we get a better life up to now? If you say yes, then you probably do not know the religion or you're trying to lie to yourself. No, we did not get a better life. In that case, as engineers, we don't just sit and look at it or talk about it. We do what we call troubleshooting. And this is a very straightforward example. It's a very, very straightforward system. The probabilities for why this is not working are only two. It's either the input is right, the output, the system is wrong, or the input is wrong, and the system is right. If we project it to reality, to this example, it means democracy is an ideal system of ruling. But you guys are not ready for it yet. Or the second probability, it means that you guys are clever, are intelligent, are ready to rule yourself perfectly, but democracy is not, not the right choice for you. So I was trying to find the right recommendation and answer the right solution. So I started interacting with people from the region. But I was shocked that there is another problem that is even much bigger than all of this. The problem was that the people that I was talking to, the leaders in there, they're depressed. They lost hope. They, do not, they no longer believe in their ability to improve things. And they look at the future, and they see it dark and black. 15 years ago, I swear to God, I was this ugly little kid in a very poor, popular neighborhood. I'm not complaining. I'm so proud of it. But at that moment, I was depressed. I was hopeless. I was like, I cannot change my situation. I was like, I, can. I looked at the future, and I saw it black. I was like, I will never travel outside of this little town. I was like, I will never wear a suit when I grew up. I will never have a proper higher education. Now, I traveled the world. I'm wearing a freaking suit that is making me uncomfortable. And guess what? I am speaking in Stanford. All that happened because of the last element of the equation. All that happened <coughs> because a wise old man whispered in my ear, and he told me the following. He told me, Son, if you do not believe in your ability to improve your current situation, if you do not believe in your ability to shape your future, if you do not believe in your ability to achieve your dreams, then you probably do not deserve them. That was my father, and now let's assemble the elements of the equation that I was telling you about. First, 
Know who you are and be proud of it. Second, be thankful and grateful and appreciate the little thing that you already have. Third, follow your passion. Don't let the system rule you. Follow your passion. Fourth, challenge your skills and adapt to changes. Five, believe in your success. If you do those, I swear to God the world will be yours. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Sure.